won't do to its friends as well as its enemies in order to get it somewhere. But see, I, I'm going to break a rule now. You, I mean, you mentioned 9-11. Basically, in public, I don't talk about it because it makes you such an easy target for abuse and false charges of anti-Semitism and everything, doesn't it? I've certainly noticed that. Yeah, so basically, I have stayed away from it because it gives them a focus to take the attention away from your main message. But since you've raised it, I'll tell you what I honestly believe. I think it probably started out as an all-Muslim operation, okay? But I think it would have been very quickly penetrated by Mossad agents. Now, it's not a secret. I detail it in my book. From almost the moment Israel was born, it had its agents penetrating every Arab government, every Arab military organization, and every Arab uh, terrorist group, whatever. So they would certainly have penetrated this. And my guess is at an early point, they said to the bad guys in the CIA, hey, this operation's running, what do we do? And the Zionists and the neocons said, let's use it. Now, what is true and what is false, I believe, is beyond that, is not arguable. The towers, the twin towers, were brought down by a controlled ground explosion, not the planes. Now, I tell you in passing that among the friends I have are consultants who work for the world's leading civil engineering and construction firm. I'm not going to name it. But they have studied the film for me, and they have said there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the planes were brought down by a control, uh, sorry, the towers were brought down by a controlled ground explosion. And then we have the film of what is sometimes called the Five Dancing Israelis. Are you aware of that, Kevin? I certainly am, yes. They were celebrating the attacks. Apparently they had set up to film even before the, before the yeah, planes well, hit, and they were high-fiving and taking pictures of each other, flicking cigarette lighters in front of the that's towers. That's right. But the point is they all had mobile phones, right? That's right. Now, they were initially reported as being Muslims. Are you aware of that? Uh, Middle Easterners, I guess, is, is the code. All right. For, uh, oh, okay, Middle Easterners. But, yes. but, but the impression was that they were Muslims. They were the bad guys. Right. So the FBI gave chase. And these five guys, they tried to avoid being arrested. But they were eventually caught. And they were arrested. And guess what? They were all Mossad agents. That's right. That was confirmed by the uh, forward. The oh, yeah. Paper. Oh, yeah. No, that's, that's fact. So it, it opens a speculation. What were they doing there? It suggests that they knew the attack. It suggests that a minimum that they knew the attack was going to happen. It's not impossible, and this is Alan Hart speculating, that the planes were fitted with transponders and that these guys were calling in the planes to the targets. It's not impossible. Uh, I suppose not. Uh, there are certainly all sorts of other possibilities, uh, but the hypothesis of remotely uh, guided planes, I think, is a very good one, given that if one had planned a, a very complex demolition of three skyscrapers, would have been the three tallest buildings in history ever taken down by controlled demolition, one would have to make sure that they got hit in order to justify that. Demolition. And is it, isn't it the case, Kevin, that quite a lot of your uh, uh, top pilots have actually said it would have been a bloody difficult job to actually drive the planes into those buildings? Well, that's right. Yes, I've had a number of members of Pilots for 9-11 Truth on my show, and they have said that the clocked speed of these aircraft, which in the case of the one that uh, hit the South Tower was nearly 600 miles per hour at sea level, uh, is a speed that, well, some of them say that uh, these aircraft 767s couldn't possibly reach that speed at ground level. They would be torn apart uh, at substantially lower speeds than that by the air pressure of the much thicker air at sea level. Uh, but in any case, that nobody in their right mind could claim that it would be possible to uh, guide a plane at that speed at sea level and uh, hit those targets in the way they were hit. So, so the speculation that they were fitted with some kind of transponder and they were called to the target electronically is, is not totally irrational? Uh, well, no, it's not. And, and in fact, it's, it's, all, it's even somewhat questionable whether uh, normal passenger aircraft would uh, be able to do that uh, consistently uh, at that kind of speed. Uh, in any case, it seems very doubtful that uh, 
pilots who couldn't solo in uh, Cessna would be uh, performing these amazing uh, aerial stunts to, uh, to hit their target. Well, that and two other things, Kevin. We, we know as a fact that at least six and possibly nine of the alleged hijackers who died are still alive. Well, that's right. That's and been living confirmed in, uh, in, in uh, J. Cole Lara's article, uh, What We Now Know About the 9-11 Hijackers, which was published actually uh, in a, a volume by uh, Europe's leading scholarly uh, outfit, uh, El Sevier. Uh, it's amazing. The scholarly literature on this is all so one-sided. Uh, there's no counter-literature except for uh, how dare, Well, the only counter-literature, how, how dare you be so anti-Semitic? That's the only counter-literature. Right, right. And, and then there's also uh, Cass Sunstein's counter-literature uh, published in, uh, was that Harvard Law Review? He's a Harvard guy who's now advising Obama. And he, he wrote an article uh, about how to deal with these terrible conspiracy theories, and he argued that the government should be infiltrating these groups and spreading uh, all kinds of diverse information to, quote, unquote, uh, spread cognitive diversity among these groups, and that at the end of the day it might be necessary to outlaw conspiracy theories. Yeah, but of course the other, the other I think, fairly chilling background indicator is that we know that Wolf, Rich, and Pearl and others wrote this document, of, I've, I've forgotten his name temporarily, about... Um, Rebuilding when, America's defenses? Yeah, well, yeah. When, when they were advising Netanyahu. Oh, to, that, yeah, that was the clean break document. That's right? the one. That's the clean break document. Right. You know, and, 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 and the strategy there was get rid of Saddam Hussein, roll back Syria, and attack Iran. That was all quite public. But we also know that Wolfowitz at some point was talking about um, the need for a Pearl Harbor incident. Well, that's right. Wolfowitz was obsessed with the strategic value of Pearl Harbor uh, and you know, he had talked about how the uh, Nazis uh, believed they would have won World War II uh, had they had uh, that kind of uh, Pearl Harbor-style incident to rally their population. Yeah, you see, I believe that the Iraq War, and I say this in my book, I believe the two prime drivers for the war were Wolfowitz and Pearl. I believe they were then supported and endorsed by the man I called Dr. Strangelove. You can guess who he was. He was Vice President Cheney. Right. And, the ho and the whole of the neocons. And the reason why, you see, uh, it wasn't an oil war. People say it was an oil war. I have spoken to oil industry chiefs, some of whom I know quite well. And they say, Alan, don't be mad. The oil industry needs stability. It doesn't need these kinds of upheavals. And right. I think that's correct. That's, that's right. Uh, James Petros has made that argument quite convincingly. I think the, the only available counter-argument would be that it's not so much the oil, it's the long-term geostrategy based on the oil that would uh, make it important to occupy uh, these parts of the world. Yeah, well, Israel had another longer-term strategic thing. It needed to get rid of Saddam Hussein because he represented the only potential, repeat potential threat of challenge to Israel's complete domination of the region. That's a very good point. And uh, now that he's uh, been done away with and Iraq has been decimated and poisoned and uh, its intellectuals and uh, scientists and technicians have been hunted down and killed by Mossad. And probably heading for civil war. Right, right. It's been taken out as a potential antagonist Israel for a very long time, and now they want to use the American military to go after Iran. Well, you see, that's fascinating, Kevin. I mean, I truly believe, and I truly believe, that Iran is not remotely interested in having nuclear bombs. But just imagine that they did have four, five, or six, or whatever. Do you think it's remotely possible that they would launch a first strike on Israel? Of course they wouldn't, because if they did, the whole of Iran would be devastated and wiped out. And they're not that stupid. No, the reason why the Israelis are hyping up Iran is to take away attention, public and political, from the ongoing Zionist colonization and genocide in Palestine. Well, that's exactly what uh, some of my uh, other uh, recent guests have said. Gordon Duff, uh, who was on my show about a week or so ago, uh, is part of a group of retired U.S. military people uh, who are uh, warning that, in fact, the Israelis want to flee forward into a wider Middle East war in order precisely to obscure their tracks, not only in terms of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, but also uh, in regarding 9-11. Uh, Alan Sabrowski, who's a friend of Gordon Duff's, is a pretty uh, respected and accomplished. Yes, I, I, I know Alan. Right. I know Alan. We respect him, yeah. 
Right. He's come right out and said that it's just it's a simple, obvious, as the nose on your face fact that the Mossad did 9-11. And, and so these people are warning that they're likely to attack the U.S. again uh, in a big way to provoke uh, yet another and wider Middle East 